Nike Air Bounds, these retail at $86.99. Nike Air Maestro, these retail at $109.99. So, uh, Nike Air Hirachi, this is uh, $124.99. And if you have any money left, Nike can sell you a shoe for even more. Their highest price shoe is the Air Jordan. It goes for $130. This father from Kent just spent nearly $300 on shoes for his family. He's typical of parents who've helped make Nike the best-selling brand in the world. Is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. For them to have the best, yes. I'm Spike, and these are my Air Raid sneakers. Nike's high-profile and persuasive ad campaigns have worked. The words, just do it, have done it for Nike. Today, they are a $3.5 billion international corporation. Their growth is enormous. $100 invested in Nike stock just 10 years ago would be worth $20,000 today. Owner and founder Phil Knight started the company in the basement of his parents' home, parlaying a $37 grub stake into a personal fortune. Today, Nike's headquarters in the Portland suburb of Beaverton is an expansive corporate complex. When you walk through this campus and you're looking at what it's become, Nike, what do you think about? Oh, I think uh, there's a, probably 98% of the time I think about uh, either the problems or the opportunities out ahead. And there's maybe one or two percent of the time where I'll uh, step back and say, it's a long way from my mother's laundry room. To some, Phil Knight is a modern day Horatio Alger story, a brilliant entrepreneur who found a need and filled it. Critics say Nike epitomizes what's wrong with American business, that it exports jobs in order to fatten the bottom line. Nike critics also attack the company for pushing expensive shoes on inner city kids, some of whom have turned to crime to get them. I was downtown one day and, and saw, these, saw a little boy just get right across the street from the bar marché, get totally beat up and his Nikes was taken. Air Jordans. I like the style. That's what's happening, Air Jordans. Today, Nike spends millions of dollars researching, designing, and marketing its sporting goods. It is a far cry from the shoe that started it all, the Waffle Trainer, named after the waffle iron Phil Knight's partner used to make the shoe's rubber sole. Knight's former University of Oregon track coach, Bill Bowerman, came up with the idea. It was Bowerman who teamed up with Knight to start the shoe company. We made the deal with a handshake and $500 a piece. Phil Knight realized that he could turn a huge profit by making his shoes overseas in Asia. The people in this Asian factory make just pennies an hour. A Boston shoemaker says it's this kind of practice that drove him out of business. Being labor intensive, they go to the ends of the earth to find out uh, where the cheapest labor is and uh, and they're now over in China, Bangkok, all over the world. Not long ago, most of America's shoes were made in factories on the East Coast. Allen Shoes in Boston stuck it out for five decades, but just couldn't compete with other shoe manufacturers who took their production overseas. So this past spring, the last shoe factory in Boston closed its doors, leaving many American workers in the lurch. All told, I've been in the shoe shop for 45 years, and so it's, and I'm not yet ready to retire. So it's kind of a letdown, but it's understandable. They're not hiring any place from what we hear, so just have to look all around. Consumers may wonder how shoes that are so inexpensive to manufacture can cost so much. Phil Knight defends his profit margin. On a pair of Air Jordans that are about $130 in the store, how much money of that goes into Nike's pocket? Well, basically the profit on the Air Jordan is, is very similar to what it is on the rest of our products in terms of percentage. You know, we average about 38% uh, our gross profit on a pair of shoes, and out of that 38%, then we have to pay, you know, the rent and salary and uh, research and development and advertising. So the bottom line will come down somewhere around uh, 12 or 13%. So $12 for every hundred is profit. That's about right, yes. Nikes are among the most expensive athletic shoes on the market. We wanted to find out if you were getting what you pay for, so we asked a panel of foot specialists in Seattle to compare shoes. Here we have the Air Jordan 130 and a Nike, also a basketball shoe, for $50. 
Is there a difference in the quality of these shoes for the price? There's not $80 worth of difference, no. Um, you're, you're paying for Michael Jordan. I mean, you're paying for the name. There is certainly some technology in the Air Jordan, whether the quality of the leather is an issue. Um, I mean, some of the detailing of the shoe is nicer, but if you know, as far as the construction of the shoe, the overall value to you as a consumer, no. You're looking at a Nike Hirachi, it's yes. about $110. Is it worth it? As far as a stability shoe, it has no heel supports whatsoever. Very little stability from side to side. Is it a bad shoe? For most of the people that buy it, yes. Not all parents are willing or able to spend top dollar on sports shoes. Once they get of age, they can go to work and buy them themselves, then they can have all the shoes they want. And some kids will get a job. But at minimum wage, it could take weeks to save up for a pair of athletic shoes. On the flip side, some kids won't wait. This Baltimore teenager was strangled in a fight to keep his Air Jordans. And just last week in St. Louis, two teens were robbed at gunpoint for their sports jackets. Nike and other sports apparel companies use personalities like Michael Jordan to influence children and parents. They buy Michael's services because of the image that he has, the esteem that's attached to him, and they meld it together with a belief that says, you can be like Michael, you can be somebody by being this. Entering in an atmosphere in the child's own environment where there may be nothing else of, uh, that he values as much as this, this stands out alone to him and he says, God, I've got to have those or else I'll die. And, and Jordan. What'd you expect? Am I fine? Superstar Michael Jordan helped form our image of Nike and with good reason. The shoe company pays him more to endorse their shoes than the Chicago Bulls pay him to play basketball. Jordan defends this expensive shoe endorsement. I think that's a misconception that the shoe companies are the blame. We are the blame in terms of going back in these communities and reestablishing our values. By no means should any materialistic thing value, overvalue another person's life. And I, I don't think you should point your fingers at a Nike or a Reebok or whoever, I think you should turn around and look in the mirror and say, are we doing enough for our community? Are we, can we reestablish those, those, those homely values that we should for our kids to follow? Nationwide, narcotics officers say they have seen many kids turn to selling drugs so they can buy the latest sportswear. If the kid has low self-esteem and feels like he needs to do something to belong or to be cool, you know, some kids will go to pretty extreme measures. Some parents complain that commercial companies and their stars are sending out the wrong messages to our children. Judy Howard of Seattle won't buy Nikes for her kids. She doesn't like the way the company does business. Michael Jordan is a scapegoat and they use him, pay him good for it. Parents. But we, we're the ones we've been paying Michael Jordan. Nike has a massive public relations campaign to counter its negative publicity. A recent book out about the company called Swoosh reveals other secrets of how Nike made it to the top. The book's co-author, Julie Strasser, says the original board meetings weren't what you might expect from this Fortune 500 company. I mean, this was a company in 1978 at a sales meeting where guys got up and made a pitch for a marijuana pipe. And yet 12 years later, they're doing anti-drug commercials. Despite its criticisms, Nike is still one of the most desired places to work in the Northwest. Their offices are flooded with more than 15,000 applications a year. Nike's campus houses daycare facilities and employee gyms. The company throws parties to promote good morale and loyalty. I think we have a closeness that maybe some other companies don't have. I'm taking tennis lessons during my lunch hour, so that's fun. <laughs> Tonight we're having beer and everybody's sitting around having fun. As a corporation, Nike may represent the best and the worst of American business in the 1980s. Aggressive entrepreneurship combined with expert marketing, while at the same time trading American jobs to increase short-term profits. So what about corporate responsibility? I think that uh, corporations should be good corporate citizens. And I think that they should take into account that when they target a particular market, uh, especially a low income market involving consumers who are children, that they are creating a pressure uh, and a need that wouldn't have existed but for their marketing. 
and therefore I think that they have a responsibility to be sensitive to the particular consumers that they are targeting. But Nike doesn't plan to let up. They are working to expand and dominate the international market for athletic apparel. Phil Knight wants to revolutionize the European market next. Recently, they purchased an American sports cap manufacturer and are planning to open up Nike superstores around the country. In an industry where style is everything, another fast-running brand could easily catch on with trend-conscious consumers. It's a very volatile industry. And you have to keep coming up with new concepts and new athletes. And as soon, Americans are extremely loyal to a brand until that brand doesn't keep up with them. And that happened to Nike once when Reebok came in. And it can very easily happen again.